Hi, I'm Gretchen. And I'm Becca. And we're two curious ladies on an adventure to learn more about cooking, cannabis, and the fine art of gluttony. Join us every 10 days or so as we get high and make our way through a recipe. Step inside and let the consumption begin. <laughs> you go? Me go? I, I don't I know. know. <laughs> I <to> start. Hi. <laughs> staring at each other do we know how to do this is this thing on hi Gretchen <laughs> hi Becca it's like we've never no. done this before every, every time every time every time it must be fun for all of our Glenn it must be just such a what a way to start every time but hello hi Gretchen how are you we're continuing our France journey we are just getting started don't you mean our France journey? <laughs> France! <laughs> oh my God. So we're going to get into that. But before we do, what are you smoking? Mm. And your wine looks beautiful. We'll have to chat about that too. Well, let's start with what I'm drinking just for funsies. Mix it up. And mix it up for once. I am drinking this beautiful pick pool, the Pinay from Guillaume de Guerres from Pomerol, France. Very beautiful, sort of minerally white wine of my favorite sort of variety. Oh, it's nice. very pretty. Yeah, it's very nice. Tastes good. Night, light crisp apple situation. Mm. But what are you drinking? I have a white wine Zinfandel from Forlorn Hope. I forgot to take down more details from the bottle and I don't have the bottle with me right now, but it's delicious. You know, it's low alcohol. It's just, it's super fun. It's got a teeny peach color to it. It's mm. beautiful. Ah, that's so exciting. Cheers. Cheers. To France. To France! To France! <laughs> <laughs> I have to watch this clip so I know how to do it. You still haven't watched it? we got to watch it together. No. Maybe after this. Let's yeah. Let's do it together. Okay. We're and I am smoking a sweet strawberry punch stinger infused joint i had half of it before we started recording so i decided to stop at that point which i think probably was a good idea good choice <laughs> but what are you smoking i have some garlic cookies it's so tasty it's got lemonine myrcene caryophylline and then a whopping 32 percent thc so as soon as you take a hit it's like right to the dome appreciate that and then i'll just <laughs> float on that lemonine thank you very much so i'm very excited i think i think the label is nature's chemistry very nice yeah my very. my thc is 30 percent, so i'm right up there with you today i that's like double for you i know I my tolerance has obviously increased of late because I've been doing all these infused joints. Like that is the thing when you start doing all that concentrated weed, it really could up your tolerance. For sure, slippery uphill slope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been doing a lot of CBD to balance that too, and it's working. Like the more I do it, the more I'm convinced that CBD it, it is the key to enjoying weed well. Like you can't, yeah. like, can't forget about the CBD. You have to have it. Mm -hmm. I've been really enjoying the CBD tincture that we have that I'll take a little bit in the morning and then mostly in the evening or at night, but I should just do a little drop when I'm, anytime I'm smoking. Yeah. I do have a tincture right now because I accidentally dosed one of my coworkers. I was worried it was going to be too intense. So I ran over to the dispensary to pick up a proof CBD tincture just in case he had a bad time. Oh, yeah. Thankfully, it was because I make a mild edible. He was good to work and just felt really nice all day. Phew. Thank God I make a light edible. I bought this really intense proof CBD that I think is like a thousand milligrams for for the bottle it's definitely packing a punch but I take a whole whole what is that a dripper full at a time I like ODing on CBD at this point <laughs> it's just a vitamin now for you yeah. part of the day 
When we got that tincture at this place here in Vegas, we were just talking to him about, oh, he, well, he was reminding us to put it under the tongue to let it dissolve in. And he also said, you should be putting edibles under your tongue, hmm. which to made help. a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah. Oh. It, yeah. Just set them under there. And so yeah. you get that like more direct delivery to the bloodstream where it can bypass the, I guess it mm-hmm. still will go through the liver. I don't know how that all works. I need to quicker know more absorption. biology. Yeah, quicker absorption. I don't know any but... of that. Yeah. What is biology? Um, but we're not here to talk about biology. No. We're here to talk about bechamel sauce. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to keep ourselves on the schedule today because as you know, we can get sidetracky. We are certainly getting sidetracked with every sentence of this <laughs> France the Cookbook, it feels like. If you're following along on the Patreon journey, we are also exploring there and having lots of thoughts and opinions. But today, this is going to be a fun one because this is one of those building block sauces that you hear about. It's also building on the tomato sauce we made last time. I'm very excited. We're making something that uses our favorite vegetable of all time, cauliflower powerhouse of nutrition cauliflower Mm -hmm. this is a nice easy dish and we're gonna keep working on our roux sauces so we are building a little bit from last time but we get to bring in some heavy cream and milk and cheese and etc etc to the (laughs) cauliflower experience as well the cauliflower experience. Enhanced cauliflower experience. Just put a bunch of cheese and heavy cream and milk in it. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> so like we said, we're continuing our journey with Franz, the cookbook. And we thought it would be fun to share one section. It's really towards the back of the book. We would never get to it ordinarily as we're just jumping around through the these recipes. But When Gretchen visited in December, we read this section through together and were tickled. Rolling. (laughs) Falling off the couch. (laughs) Yes, it was. It's ridiculous. It's hysterical. We wanted to share this with our gluttoners. And then we're going to get into reading more about Jeanette's thoughts on fresh vegetables, on Gruyere cheese, on roux-based sauces, because all of those are going to be pieces of what we're doing today. And then we're going to dig into the actual recipes that we're making. Oh my gosh. So exciting. (laughs) It's a lot of territory to cover. This is why we need a timer. Yeah, exactly. We got to do this efficiently. The kitchen. This is on page 922. And I want to read the publisher's note real quick first. It says, Jeanette Matteo's notes on kitchen design and dining etiquette have appeared in various guises throughout the history of Jeté Cuisine. Although some of her suggestions may seem to belong to a bygone era of French homemakers, much of her advice is still relevant for modern cooks today. We will see about that. We've been doing a lot of 2023 updates to this book. (laughs) Today, not so much. We're not going to have as much to say about the 2020 updates. This one's pretty straightforward. Only this kitchen part of like where we have a Uh lot of 2020 updates. A little bit of an update here. (laughs) Needed Exactly. So let's get into it. The kitchen, according to Jenny. Cooking can be time consuming and painstaking, but a well-designed kitchen can save time and effort. In a well thought out kitchen, you can work methodically and practically. You may not have the perfect kitchen, but you can always organize it to make it more efficient, even one with many flaws. Okay, so far, I agree. I'm on board. So far, yes. There's there's not a lot to argue with in that very general statement. <laughs> Be organized. Done. Okay. Yeah, what got else? it. What should we do next then, Jenny? The walls should have a washable painted surface in a light color and should be tiled to a height of around six and a half feet. Okay, I have questions already now. We are <laughs> one okay. sentence into the next paragraph. What? It has to be tiled to six and a half feet and a light color. It has to be. It does. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I have no idea. I know. Um, no other option. Light, light color, just because like wash marks are typically more noticeable on like a darker surface. Mm-hmm. Also, washable surfaces tend to be 
more non-stick is kind of the way I'm going to put it. It'll resist getting dirty a little bit more than something that's not washable. That's just mm-hmm. my experience more than anything else mm-hmm. that tells me that. I don't know about the tile up to, to six and a half feet. That feels like I don't think anybody puts tile in their kitchen anymore. I think we've all decided also, that it gets dirty. It's hard to clean. And yeah. only up to six and a half feet. What if your walls are only seven feet tall? You got to get that that last half can't be tile. It's got to be yeah. something different. See where we're going with this? We mm-hmm. are barely into this section. So I'll try yeah. to reverse my thoughts for a little bit so I can keep going. Okay. But the floor should have a durable, easy to clean covering. Open shelves and cupboards should be kept to a minimum, as it is better to have everything enclosed. Surfaces should be smooth with rounded corners, avoiding moldings, which can be difficult to clean, and all the shelves covered in light-colored plastic. Avoid displays of innumerable spice jars. Their aesthetic appeal is debatable, and they can be time-consuming to clean. Wow, a lot is happening there. <laughs> Basically, it comes down to avoid clutter is the the main thread of that. She's not wrong. Usually if you're using your kitchen quite heavily or you're me or related to me genetically, your kitchen is quite messy. Therefore, small if the, the more small things you have about to clean, the harder it is to clean. So that's her Absolutely. main issue. She's just very specific about rounded corners, cop cabinets covered in plastic or shelves covered in plastic. Spicers can't be out. Don't do it. It's taboo for her. It's very interesting. It was, a, yeah. it was a different time. Was it? Yes. There's also stuff available today that they didn't have then. You know, we had a lot mm-hmm. more, like mo- a lot of cabinetry. Yes, it's made out of good wood, which... Back then, it would have been really made out of wood. Now we have plywood or fiberboard and stuff like that. And those things usually come pre-coated. There's more choices as far as that goes. I'm not sure why everything needs to be light colored. The rounded corners makes a lot of sense to me. As somebody who has smacked their heads Mm. more times than they can (laughs) count on their hood for their (laughs) stove. Uh It has a very sharp corner to it. Yeah. I see the value in rounded corners, let me tell you. (laughs) Sure. They are easier to clean. (laughs) Easier to clean, more human and dog and friendly. Friendly, yeah. yeah. So particular. And at this point in our life, we'd have to like redo our whole kitchens to meet this standard that she's saying is just about efficiency. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, she has... A lot of strong thoughts about a lot of things going on here. I love it. Okay, I'm going to read the next two paragraphs and then we will keep moving. A kitchen should be generously lit, but the lighting can be difficult to adjust. However, opaque glass can be replaced with transparent window panes so that work can be performed continuously in the right order and the same ground does not have to be covered twice. This saves time and is more convenient and can be achieved by grouping together the furniture used for different operations, such as food preparation, washing up, and eating. A kitchen clock is very useful, particularly if it also functions as a timer. Dish towels also deserve special attention. They must be kept very clean so that any earthenware that has just been washed is not contaminated. A good supply of paper towels is extremely useful, especially when preparing food, cleaning fish, draining vegetables, and so on. That whole paragraph was spot on. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, too, that she was saying in the 1930s to replace, like, to put glass panels into solid doors to add, like, lighting. Lighting. I know that's a popular thing to do now with pantry doors and kitchen doors is have glass insert oh god it's absolutely not no i do not yeah, want I yeah <laughs> i, I, I think she, that. yeah <laughs> she's just talking about doors in general like from room to room even doors she might be talking about or i think this is all just the kitchen 
Right. But she's talking about if like you had a solid door from like outside or from another room coming mm. into mm-hmm. the kitchen, like mm-hmm. you'd be able to, if you used a solid, a piece of glass versus a solid door, you can take advantage of light from outdoors or from another room that might be helpful. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. We agree, Jenny. We agree. Okay. We agree with Last part here. To maintain the refrigerator in good working order, ensure the cold air can circulate. Do not cover the plastic racks or overfill the shelves. It should be defrosted and cleaned once a week. Store the foods logically, taking account of the fact that the coldest part is often at the top and therefore suitable for meat or fish and it is less cold at the bottom and therefore good for storing fruits and vegetables. Wrap food or put it in boxes with lids before storing in the refrigerator. In the refrigerator and the freezer, food should be rotated and expiration dates should be checked frequently. A vegetable rack is a useful way to store potatoes, onions, shallots, and garlic. Racks can be fixed under a shelf to save space. I love that idea. It's a good one. That is what I should be using under shelves for. I've just got one that's got random crap in it. I should be storing my veggies and onions and stuff there. I love it. There's a lot of unused space in my pantry that could be used in a different way. So yeah, I actually need to take that into advisement. I got to buy a few things for the house at this point. Well, those are Jenny's preferences for a well-maintained kitchen. She's very opinionated, but she's not wrong about any of it. It's nope. just not totally feasible in our timeline. Right. All right. Fresh vegetables, page 508. It doesn't have the page number there. It's a, it's a fun image of a guy smoking, <laughs> holding a big watermelon, and a woman standing across the counter from him holding her finger Whoa. up <laughs> one with the one finger. So she it's asking for one of something or lecturing him about smoking while working with food? Yeah, it's unclear. It's unclear. We can only see his face and he doesn't ha- he only has one big eyebrow across his whole forehead and minim- he doesn't have a face like no mouth. We can't read yeah. his facial expression here. He does so have one happening. <laughs> eyebrow raised. I might point out mm-hmm. that there is one mm-hmm. eyebrow that is elevated. So mm-hmm. he's definitely skeptical about what this woman is saying, which makes <laughs> me think she's lecturing him about smoking. And he's like, do you want the watermelon or, lo- or not, lady? <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Okay, fresh vegetables. Fresh vegetables play a vital role in our diet because they contain easily absorbed minerals, vitamins, and fiber. The great variety of vegetables available means that menus can be varied almost infinitely. Most vegetables can be eaten raw or cooked. Even though they keep relatively well for several days, it is better to use them quickly to preserve their nutritional value. And since we are using fresh cauliflower today, even though we have already blanched it, spoiler alert, it was fresh at one point. (laughs) It's actually better if you, when you get your vegetables to cook them quickly, because once they're cooked, the nutritional value actually holds a lot better. So it's actually freezing kind of, kind of. Yes. Okay. So then we also wanted to just read her quick notes on Gruyere cheese since that's a big component of not only our sauce but then the cauliflower dish itself it's on page 914 under Jeanette's kitchen advice Gruyere cheese Gruyere cheese can be preserved for longer by wrapping it in a slightly damp cloth that has been soaked in water with a little vinegar to store it in the refrigerator put the Gruyere in a box with a lid Add one or two sugar cubes and replace them when they start to melt. The Gruyere will not dry out. So (laughs) many thoughts. You (laughs) have so many thoughts. How does the sugar melt in the fridge? Just the uh, ambient humidity. Moisture. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Who would have thought that wrapping it in a damp cloth with water and vinegar? I, I never would have imagined this. So I think the the vinegar is just to help keep bacteria off the cloth for a little bit more than anything. And then the damp is with for the cheese. But yeah, that's fascinating. I'm not sure that I've held on to Gruyere long enough to have any drying out happen. I didn't know it was prone to that, but good to know. Yeah, good to know. I wonder how long it lasts then. 
I mean, it's a hard cheese, so it would last quite a long time. Properly stored like that? Yes. (laughs) So then the last thing we wanted to read over before moving into the recipes is roux. Roux Roux-based sauces. Right. We made a roux last week, but we're going to do a refresher because it is the most important base of this sauce for a lot of sauces. But this one today is very important. So a roux is a sauce made with flour, cooked in fat, usually butter, then made into a paste by adding a hot liquid. Depending on how long the flour is cooked, the color and flavor of the sauce will be more or less pronounced. Roux can be white, blonde, or brown. They can be mixed with a wide variety of liquids, such as water, milk, stock, wine, or the liquid in which the dishes with which they are to be served have been cooked. The principle is the same for all types of roux. Put the butter in the pan and melt it without letting it change color if making a white roux, which we're doing today. Today. Mm -hmm. Add the flour. Cook, stirring with a wooden spoon until the mixture becomes frothy. Allow the flour to cook until it turns pale brown for a blonde roux or brown for a brown roux. Once the flour is cooked to the right stage, Gradually pour in the hot liquid, stirring briskly and steadily over fairly high heat. However, do not let a brown roux get too dark because the resulting sauce will be too brown and have a bitter, acrid taste. What temperature do you start at with the butter? If you, is it always fairly high heat the whole time? I mean, I usually probably go, f- I'm trying to decide how definitive I want to be about this because. Yeah. More often than not, I will do medium heat just to start it off because you don't want to get a lot of fast cooking on the butter itself. Mm -hmm. I want it to melt like fully before it starts to cook. I'm not usually going that high of a heat. I think it also depends how much you want it cooked. So if I was doing like a darker colored roux, I probably go for a higher heat to just accelerate that process. Okay. When we go into the kitchen to start our sauce and we start with the roux, are we going to start more of like a medium heat with the butter? And then yeah. once we, we'll put the flour in and keep it the same heat. And then when we put the liquids in, start turning it up a little bit. Well, or... because we're working with milk today, I'm also going to keep that on the lower side. Because we don't want it to scorch and like if it toasts a little on the bottom, that would be okay. But because we are dealing with a higher protein liquid, I'd probably keep it on medium. Okay. That's just the point where she says over fairly high heat. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see. I think that's enough of my review prep side of things. Do you want to read the cauliflower gratin recipe first and then read the cheese sauce component of it? Or the other way around? Yeah, let's do it that way. Just because the gratin is really what we're making for the episode today. So we'll start with that. It's the more basic of the recipes. And we will be leading off with the sauce in the kitchen. If I read this now, that's a good overview. And then we'll hop to that recipe because that'll be the most fresh in our minds when we get in there. Because that'll be the stuff we need first. Perfect. I got so excited I started talking before you. (laughs) (laughs) For the cauliflower gratin, we need one and a quarter pounds of cauliflower, one quantity of cheese sauce or Mornay sauce, and a half a cup of grated Gruyere cheese. Once we've made our cheese sauce in the kitchen, we are going to proceed with the cauliflower gratin and the steps for that are as follows. We have actually already prepared our cauliflower by cutting it into florets and blanching it in hot water and then just set it aside to drain. We are going to preheat our oven to 425 degrees. Our cauliflower florets are going to go into a buttered dish. And then we're going to put that cheese sauce all over it, sprinkle with cheese, and bake for 10 to 15 minutes until golden. Cheese, please. (laughs) So much cheese. We love the cheese. So what is that cheese sauce then? So this is where our roux education continues. We are going to talk about white sauce, bechamel sauce, and cheese sauce. Or sauce Mornay, 
if we want to be mm-hmm. real fancy. Mm-hmm. This would be what I would consider the major roux sauce. This is the w- number one when you say sauce like of the roux this is what you're going to think of is a bechamel. For me, it's like you hear roux and I think immediately bechamel. They're so intertwined. That makes total sense. I think for me, for people who maybe are new to these words, thinking about the cauliflower gratin, gratin, it says put cheese sauce as a component of it. Then we go to the cheese sauce and it's called a sauce mornay. So not only is it not just cheese sauce, it's sauce mornay in the book too. So we're talking about Two things for the same thing here already. (laughs) But that one says to stir cheese into a white or bechamel sauce. I think I've been confused a little bit because we were saying roux, then cheese sauce, then bechamel. And I'm not sure (laughs) what the order and the flow is of what what comes first and how do we do that? And how do we get to the cheese sauce portion of it sort of thing? So I think we've covered what a roux itself is pretty well in the previous episode, plus possibly before that for other things. So I'm not going to focus on that part. We're going to start with the white sauce because this is actually a concept I (laughs) had not really thought about before because white sauce is thickened water is the best way to put it. It's water thickened with roux. So that's a white sauce and seasoned with salt and pepper. And they probably like you to use white pepper, but that's the French for you. So bechamel is milk thickened with a roux. Okay. Same process, just with milk versus water. And then for the cheese sauce, aka, if you're French, sauce mornay, that is a, you can use either of the two sauces we've just discussed, but add cheese. And it typically is gruyere, if you're a true mornay sauce, is gruyere. So she's just limiting that part of it. But you could mix any cheese into this that you would like. Right. And because this is, if you're making a homemade mac and cheese, this is what you're making. This is the sauce you're making. Exactly. Yes. Okay. For homemade mac and cheese. So we're making you're... homemade Colin cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Colin <and> cheese. <laughs> Might be healthier for you, but no, probably not. <laughs> Debatable. Yeah. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. So roux is the base base first. Then you can add water, and that's a white sauce. Then instead of water, you could add milk, and that's a bechamel, which is most common because, like, water's boring. Yes. So (laughs) Exactly, water's boring. (laughs) Yep. And then what we're doing, which seems silly but makes sense too, is make a roux, make a bechamel by adding milk to the roux, then add cheese to yes. that creation at that point correct you and then have... once we make once we make that sauce we mix that into our blanched cauliflower and then add more gruyere on top yes absolutely yes more yes cheese. yes <laughs> you've got it oh, you've so nailed good. it all down yes i got this i'm ready Are you i ready? think i'm ready i guess when we hit the kitchen you're going to Talk me through making the sauce, right? And then you're going to make the sauce or... We're going to make the sauce, yes. We're going to make it together. Gretchen's going to talk me through it. Even though we have made a roux, we did it last time for tomato sauce. And we, I, I've i made some version of a bechamel without even realizing what I was doing. So I can do this, but I'm still nervous. I'm always nervous when there's like heat up your milk things happening. Well, let's just talk through the whole process right now before we get All right, because I'm ready. I'm like, I'm on it. My brain is ready. We're going to go through this step by step. Number one, we're going to take our, what is this? We're taking two heaping tablespoons. We're going to talk about that heaping thing in a little, in a minute. Mm -hmm. We've got one third cup flour, two generous cups of hot milk and salt and pepper. I think I've already read this, but here we go. (laughs) I forgot I wasn't reading the ingredients. I was supposed to go with the steps. Shit. Well, that's okay. I don't know if we fully read all the ingredients either. So that's right. perfect too. Starting with those things, because the cheese comes in at the end, we officially start with the butter, melt that in our pan. Then we will sprinkle in our flour once that's melted. Then we stir those two things together and it'll come together in kind of a paste-like substance. 
we probably should have heated up our milk on the stove, but I'm thinking we'll just toss in the microwave and warm it up real fast because I don't feel like getting more pans dirty and it's totally acceptable to just throw it in the microwave. I assumed that's where you were going to go, so I have it in a microwave-ready dish. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I actually hadn't thought it through, so now I have. Right, here we are. And we're going to take that hot milk that we're going to microwave and add it while whisking into our roux. Then we're going to let that cook for a couple minutes just until it thickens up. You're looking to make this your own. So so you like a thinner sauce, you'll add more liquid, not as much liquid for a thicker, more coating sauce. We're probably wanting something a little bit thicker for our application today versus something that maybe you're putting on top of something else some fish or chicken something i don't know what i forget what you put bechamel with but like noodles it always goes with noodles yeah it sounds just so good on anything and once we've reached our desired consistency we will add a cup of grated cheese today we are using gruyere we are being very traditional and just stir that until the cheese is fully incorporated we can add a little bit of grated nutmeg if we feel like it I'm not sure if we will or not. If I remember, maybe I will, but it does work nicely with cauliflower. I bet. I can see that it would taste good. We'll see. We'll see. You got this. We've done this many times. We've done similar things. We have done very similar things. I can do this. What world level is it, though? Uh, I think this is a two, just because there's burn risk, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Alert. Burn risk. Alert. Burn risk. (laughs) And then we will need a pot, which we've already used for boiling or blanching our cauliflower, yep. and then a sauce pot for making the bechamel, mm-hmm. and then our buttered dish, which I'm using a 9 by 13 and Gretchen's using more of a 9 by 9 shape casserole It's an dish. oval. Yeah, it's, it's, an a, oval. it's an oval. I think it's a two-quart dish. So it's quite a bit smaller. I think yours would probably be about four quart. So we're testing to see, do we like a more condensed casserole-like gratin or a more laid out crunchy gratin, mm-hmm. I think is mm-hmm. where we're, we, you might end up, which would be yeah. very interesting. I think so. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit as we're in the kitchen working on this recipe, but there are a few things that are, as much as this, these recipes are straightforward, there are some pieces that are left very vague. One of them in particular is what size oven dish to use or what shape or even just kind of a guide here for what dish to be using in the oven. But then the last thing you need is a grater, obviously, for all the all of that cheese. Because <laughs> by the end of this, we have, will have used a cup and a half of grated cheese between the sauce and then topping, which they she's allowed half a cup for that. We'll see what actually ends up on the yeah on the top. Okay, I have a good sense. I think I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's do it. We're back in the kitchen. Our pans are over a medium heat. We are about to put in our heaping two tablespoons of butter. In we go. And our cauliflower is in our baking dish, ready to be cheesed up. Cheesed. Yes. Cheesed. It is ready to be cheesed. Okay, wooden spoon, right? Yep. I got some... Quick melting happening. I know it's not so quick, but I think you turned your heat on just a little bit sooner than I did. Sure. Getting Let's there. Start. Getting there. It's going. So I'm completely melted. So I'm about okay. to add my flour. Okay. Half a cup. Is it a half or a third? A third, a third, a third. Because this one was, okay, so we have a he- two heaping tablespoons of butter, which means... If you have more butter than that, great, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, which, yeah, is, again, vague. We were joking earlier when we were talking about the recipe that, like, she obviously didn't take this from Fanny Farmer's book or that, like, preciseness from Fanny Farmer because Fanny would never put heaping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, the, the whole scant heaping thing is hilarious to me. Yeah. What do you mean, Jenny? What is this? What is this? Yeah, it's like slightly higher than, slightly more than two tablespoons. I got a paste. All right, I am yeah. extremely pasty over here. Same. So 
I'm oh, about... and I gotta heat up my milk. Shoot, so do I. 30 seconds? I'd probably say at least a minute. I'm actually gonna turn the heat down now just okay. to make sure we don't low. get any cooking. Because it does say our milk is supposed to be hot, so I'm assuming it might be a two minute heat up in the microwave to get it there. Yeah. Since it's supposed to be pretty, pretty white, this sauce, I don't want it to get any more color. Tense for a second. Now it's just waiting. Like, I know. Little stir. A little, little waiting. Yeah. <laughs> Staying light colored. Okay, I'm checking on my milk. Probably a little more for me. Yeah, I'm going to stir it real well and then I'm going to put it back. Because, yeah, it's just like barely warm. Mine is barely warm after a minute. Okay, let's go. Another minute? Yes. Okay. Rue, hang tight, little friend. I think we're going to be able to do it, as long as the milk is at least somewhat warm now. I think we could go ahead as, you know, I'm like, how hot does it really need to be? As long as it's warmed. Yeah. I have a little steam. I also have some steam. Let's do it. I think it's great. Let's do it. Let's go. And a whisk? Yeah whisk slowly add yeah well the first little bit is going to be the most challenging part but once it starts to get really saucy (laughs) Uh well you know once you've broken up the roux a bit with the liquid it'll it'll get a lot easier okay i don't think i need to be this slow as i'm going with this okay i'll follow suit and just pour the rest in also because i was like ah my arm (laughs) yeah i know my hand's beginning to hurt from the whisking I did put about half spilling. of mine in. Mine was spilling all over the place. It's like, oh yeah, Pyrex cups sometimes really suck balls. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to turn my heat back up. Oh, <laughs> so did I. <laughs> now I've got it all in there. Well, now that it's well combined, I'm going to go back to my spoon. Okay. Scrape a little more of that brew off the spoon. Why the wooden spoon again? Because Marcella often specifically would say wooden spoon too. Well, especially in that time, your plastic spoons would have not necessarily been melt resistant, number one, and also not, uh, what's the word I want to use, like leach resistant. So like the plastic could get into your food a lot easier, but then also metal spoons can be problematic because it can affect your food. Wood is just the most neutral Uh medium as far as when they were writing these cookbooks. Okay, I'm going to raise sure. the heat on mine just a smidge because I we, we're going to need a at least to get quite warm. Okay, I'll turn mine up too. In order to get the, the thickening we want. The thickening. The thickening. I went back to my whisk for a second because I had a few clumps at the bottom. Yeah, I'm seeing a few lumpies in there. Okay, probably the heat wasn't high enough. Or just got stuck in a corner while you were whisking uh, and cut, you know, you're scraping with a spoon. Yeah. Really good at hide and seek little roux pockets. Because it's always an option too. If you like find your sauce is extremely lumpy, there is always the option to put it through a strainer or a sieve. Mm-hmm. That is an option you can use. It's that that Bridget Jones. Yes. Ongoing there, thing. Yeah. Yes. Don't sieve it, Pam. <laughs> Ideally, you would not want to sieve. You do what you got to do. Oh, mine's mm. now mine's really boiling. I'm going to turn it down again. <laughs> okay. Boop, too hot, too hot. <laughs> too hot, too hot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping. So my sauce is a little loose. That's why I'm trying to get more of a full boil. Mm-hmm. But that is really dangerous because you can scorch it pretty easily. Just because you got so much protein and starch in here, those things love to burn. Mm-hmm. but our cheese will also thicken it some mine is getting so. pretty thick i'm more worried about these clumps though i mean you can always like hop between the two i was definitely thinking i might just do a quick whisk on mine whisk. see if i can break okay. it up okay oh yeah that's seems to be getting some of them but yeah you just can't only use the whisk because I it'll gotcha. it's you need good. something to scrape the the sides and the bottom with oh uh-huh okay Mine's getting pretty thick. I think I'm probably at the point where I'm just going to stop because there will be thickening from the cheese. So I'm going to turn off my heat. Okay. And I'm going to start adding my cheese. We're going to add like a little bit at a time, whisk it in a little bit at a time, whisk again. Okay. Back to the whisk. Back to the whisk. Okay. It's kind of sprinkling it in. 
I've got mine in a cast iron pot. So I've actually got some residual heat that's going to keep cooking that a little bit too. Good thing okay. I turned it off when I did. Yeah. Probably. Hey, mine's pretty steamy. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Ooh, mine's pretty thick. <laughs> Yum. I'm so excited. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm almost out of cheese here. Same. Just put my last bunch in. Oh, we need salt and pepper. Huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to do nutmeg? I think so. I Well, I'm going to taste it, and then I'll decide. Now I'll taste it. Way more salt, nutmeg in it, just for... Something sweet? Yeah, a little balance there. Might have put a little too much pepper in. I think I might have put a little too much salt. As long as you haven't over-salted your cauliflower, it'll probably be fine. I didn't salt my cauliflower. Then all the better. Oh, okay. Did you? Mm Mm-hmm. When? I salted my water when I boiled them. That's the number one. I only have whole nutmeg, and I don't really want to deal with that. (laughs) I'm not doing that. (laughs) Okay. That's your choice. I have so much whole nutmeg that I just want to use it. want to? Yeah. Yeah, I probably should, because I never use I never use it. You're right. It's right there. Okay, just get it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mm. That's delicious. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, that really did it. Oh, that's good. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So now we pour it into the cauliflower. Uh huh. If I can stop eating it long enough to do that. I know. Yeah. It's torture. I'm trying to tell myself it's going to be better on the other side. I'm going to have more it, cheese on the other side. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. All right. So Going good. in. Go in. Oh, look at that sexy cheese. Ooh. Oh, the euphoria of cheese. Right. <laughs> this is a lot of sauce. It is a lot of sauce. I didn't think it, I was like, that's not going to be enough sauce, but it's. Oh, no. I was wondering how how much sauce it was going to be, but it's even more than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> mm, cheesy goodness. This is a fun base, too, because I could imagine adding garlic and mustard and a bunch of, like, mustard powder. Yeah. Like cheesy kind of flavor. All right, I'm going to push it together, I guess, is the best way to describe what I'm doing. <laughs> like, sh- just shoving my spoon in and moving the cauliflower around slightly. Good idea for broccoli. Yeah, that would be good. You love broccoli and cheese. I love broccoli and cheese. My grandma used to make a broccoli cheese casserole like at least once a week or once every Mm. other week when I was a kid. Yeah. I love broccoli. Oh my gosh. This is just, I probably could have put like half the amount of this cheese on here. Oh, really? It seems like it's so much sauce. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be so amazing, but it's just like, I feel like there's more sauce than cauliflower. I didn't actually weigh the cauliflower I got, so I wonder if oh, I didn't have enough. Maybe that's what's going on because it feels perfect. accurate for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to, I want to see yours when you're mm. done. Mm-hmm. But also, like this, the pan situation. Right. Like, it just seems like a lot of sauce. Did you sprinkle yours already or no? So this is mine. And it looks like a lot of cheese. It's like on the side, you can see it like sitting in it. Yeah. <laughs> Yum, though. Soupy. I mean, yeah. No, yeah I don't think it's going to suck. No. <laughs> and then this is mine. Oh, yeah. So I must have not bought enough broccoli. And yeah, you, yours definitely fills up that nine by. I definitely anticipated dish. it being a lot thinner layer. It's. Yeah. It's pretty full. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. two and a half pounds. Pounds. That's a lot. That is a lot. Okay, so sprinkle it with the rest of the cheese, and then we got to get this in for 10 to 15. Is that right? Yep, yep. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. I definitely picked the biggest head of cauliflower I could find. Clearly, two and a, half, two and a quarter pounds is even more than I would have thought. I guess so. Well, I did two heads. You got two heads. Okay, so that's yeah. probably why. It was a lot more than I thought it would be. Yeah, it uh, is a lot. This is quite a lot. Well, uh, it beats six, right? That I mean, is true. Oh, you're putting a baking dish under yours? I am, just because it's so full. I don't really want to have to scrape cheese sauce off the bottom of my oven. Mm-hmm. Better safe than sauce. Sorry. Or, yeah, better safe, safe than scraping stuff off the bottom of the oven later, slash setting oh. the fire alarms off. <laughs> We've done that, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, no. 10 to 15 minutes? Yes. I'm going to start with 10. Start at 10. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I did cool my cauliflower down, so I suspect it's actually going to take 
a little bit more like 15 to 20 for mine because it didn't mm-hmm. get to sit and it wasn't warm yet still. Same. Mine in cauliflower, including the sauce when it went in was almost cold, like not cold, cold but room temp. Cold. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So we'll go to time travel and then we'll report back. See you in the future. 20 minutes later in the future-ish. <laughs> we definitely went 20 minutes and it's steamy. It's a it's hot, hot little baby here. She's hot, cheesy, hot, cheesy thing going on here. Looks good. We took a little piece out a, a minute ago to try to let it cool to not totally sacrifice our tongues to the meal gods here. Right. I think we're ready. Mine's starting to like settle a little. and A little bit, yeah. yeah. I can tell it's... The top has cooled off slightly, at least. Definitely needed a bit more cauliflower, as far as I can tell, in my gratin here. Okay. So I've got a lot of sauce. Not necessarily a bad thing. I don't have any sauce. I mean, it's just... All baked in. Pretty much. When it first came out, there was some more liquidity to it. Fluidity. Mm. But now it's pretty stiffened. I do, I do just really have more of a nice coating of mm. sauce. It's not really extra sauce. That was a good cheese bowl. Mm. I got some top wow. quality cheese going on here. Mm-hmm. This is really good. I, there's a little bit of crunch, just enough to the cauliflower just still. Mm-hmm. I, I wish I'd salted the cauliflower. It's not bad. I'm sure. But I figure because you a little think, feel like you lint a little over on the sauce, that at least the, that balances that out. So it's mm-hmm. not so dire. Mm-hmm. It's so good. I, I love it. <laughs> It doesn't feel too rich. Right. It's surprising. Do you have any wine left? Mm-hmm. Good idea. Mm. It's good with the big pool. It's pretty good with the Zinfandel. It kind of just obliterates it, though. It doesn't make it taste negatively. It just wipes it out. But as long as it doesn't make it taste bad. Wiping it out, not ideal, but it is the best case scenario for a blind, untested pairing. Mm-hmm. We're obviously enjoying it. I don't yeah, know if very our just need to keep listening to us just eat. <laughs> we might also be hungry. So we're very hungry. <laughs> oh, we're always hungry. Always. Oh, that's real good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is again from France the Cookbook. We are, I think, loving everything we're doing from here so far. You know, I was a little worried because of the lack of other things going into this gratin that it would be boring. Or bland, but it's wonderful. Just very perfect simplicity, top-notch mm-hmm. simplicity. Mm-hmm. So I can't get over how the cauliflower tastes so crisp and fresh. Not just the texture crisp, but even the flavor. Like it's just very present. But then mm-hmm. the cheese just makes everything so melty and smooth Yum. and yummy. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. Ultimate Ooh. comfort food with cauliflower yeah. in there. Yeah. I have seen some recipes that do half cauliflower, half mac and cheese, and I'd always poo pooed it. But this kind of inspires me now to maybe That's throw a good in idea. cauliflower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why not? A little veggie, like cauliflower. It can work with anything. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a nice, mostly blank canvas. Mm-hmm. Find we us will. online. Yeah. Yeah, we will share things. We will try. <laughs> Someday, yeah. It'll happen. But join, find us on Patreon. We have our Patreon now. Oh my gosh. Ah, we're, digging into this, we're digging into this book even more. It's more stony. It's more sidetracks. It's more <laughs> conversations. It's all the things you want. I know it. <laughs> all the sidetracks. We aren't cutting any sidetracks <laughs> no. out. You get the side trackiest side tracks of all time unless it's really right. really unrelated then we we cut it out maybe but yeah. so far we haven't had to. so far mm-mm. we've just been oversharing away it's been wonderful <laughs> overshare <laughs> okay so off we go off we go clap 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 oh shit i forgot to get my coconuts i found them but i, I know. forgot to get them Come we'll get them for the next one yeah okay all right, all right. bye bye <laughs>